So I'm really excited to kind of bring these two worlds together and specifically talk about PASS. And without further, further ado, I'm going to have our panelists go ahead and introduce themselves. And they are a rock star panel. So thank you guys for coming. All right. Thank you. I don't know if this is working. My name's Erin Jacobs. I'm the uh, CSO, CSO for a company called UCB. We're a major financial service receivables outsourcer. We run call centers and receive receivable call centers and support centers throughout the U.S. and Latin America. I'm uh, David Mortman. I'm the chief security architect for Instratus, which uh, John has already described quite well earlier. <laughs> uh, my name is Ralph Los. I am the chief security evangelist for HP Software. Um, yeah. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gal Sponsor, and uh, I'm an independent security consultant. I've uh, been in InfoSec uh, about 11 years now, and all these people are great people. Good panel. Yay. And nice. as a side note, uh, for those of you who don't know Gal, he always wears the sunglasses and hat to every conference, so it's like his trademark. He's not, I, I don't know what you want to call him. I was going to tell them that it's a security and privacy conference, so I, so I had to come in disguise, but you were. Right. <laughs> All right, so um, you know, just to start the panel off, I'm just going to ask a general cloud security question, and then we can dive into more past issues. So um, as we all know, security is not a cloud-specific issue. However, the primary concern enterprises have when moving to the cloud is security. So as, as you guys are all security experts, what are your initial thoughts on security in the cloud in general when you, when you first hear about that? Any of you guys can take that away. Well, the, the traditional security response is, no! <laughs> um, the, the, the more appropriate security response is that um, the cloud's actually no more no, and no less secure than doing anywhere else. You just need to understand what you get and what you don't get so you can make some intelligent decisions about how you're going to operate. Right, and I would just add to that that also it's very important when speaking of the cloud or speaking of just in, internal infrastructure, or I should say public cloud versus internal infrastructure, is just keeping in mind what you're actually exposing out there and making sure that the right decisions are being made. You can uh, look at the cloud and say it's insecure or more secure or as secure, uh, and you can delude yourself that the people in your organization, government, uh, private enterprise otherwise are not using cloud because you told them to, but in fact they are. Uh, most people I've talked to that have done some basic audits in terms of outgoing connections uh, to cloud services, uh, any enterprise uh, larger than X people, and, and uh, why uh, millions of dollars will typically see dozens of different cloud services being accessed on a daily basis, none of them authorized. So the fact that you do not officially enable cloud doesn't mean it's not going on. Uh, one of the things you look at uh, developers wanting to spin up some instance uh, on their own credit card because it takes so long for the corporate IT department to give them freaking IT resources to do their job. So you have to really be careful to not be the cloud Nazi and say <laughs> no because it will happen without your control, which is typically worse than with a little bit of your influence. So that's one aspect of it. Uh, there are some pieces of content that belong on public cloud, you know, things that you want people to read, marketing stuff, newsletters, whatever, PDFs of technical specs. Why would you waste money and resources on infrastructure that is all secured up when this is, in fact, a zero confidentiality issue? Um, so, so you have to look at what kind of data, how long it's going to be out there, who's going to consume it, what's the pattern of consumption, uh, things like that. And cloud is being Cloud is going on in your environment. You just have to figure out what, what is appropriate in the context. And cost, obviously, is an issue. So I'm going to uh, kind of echo what's been said a little bit, but change it just slightly in that um, the cloud is basically about business agility, which is something information security has historically been horrible at. So this is a sort of a collision of a, uh, the uh, unstoppable force and the immovable object, um, the immovable object being security. And we're going to lose if we continue to try to be the immovable object. Um, and it's, it's sort of like uh, security in, in the cloud uh, with everybody and lots of people in the security community shouting, no, 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 it's a bad thing. Public cloud's bad. Cloud is bad. It's sort of like um, the fact that, uh, you know, everybody, there's all these shark awareness things and everybody's afraid of sharks. But in reality, uh, more vending machines kill people than sharks do. So I, I think... <laughs> Sure, seen that coming. Um, but but 
I think we really kind of need to focus on uh, sort of getting back to, from a security perspective, back to enabling organizations versus trying to go back to get what Gal was saying. You know, there, there's things that are appropriate for cloud computing. Um, it certainly is a business enabler of agility. I uh, mean, most companies, if you can't be agile today, you're kind of done, especially in this economy. Okay. Um, well, let's just move this more into a more past specific uh, discussion. Um, let's start off on a positive note. What do you guys feel are the potential security benefits of past cloud offering? David, I think you might, you might want to address this. <laughs> uh, I have a thought or two. <laughs> Those of you who know me are unsurprised. Um, so essentially, one of the great things about PAWS is that it really gives you the ability to more readily enforce uh, certain uh, restrictions in terms of use of certain libraries or system calls or make sure that certain kinds aren't used. And that just makes it a lot easier to, uh, to get things done. It also uh, enables you to generate a more uniform infrastructure for your app code to be run on. So it's not so much a, a code-specific issue as just that when you're using a PAWS, you just have a much higher confidence level that, you're, that every server is configured more consistently and more accurately, which just leads to a, a more manageable environment. And the more manageable your environment is, the more secure it is. Aaron, um, you, oh, sorry, to, to add on to that, and, and in rare form agreeing with David, uh, I, th I think one of the things that we, so in keeping with the theme of agility uh, and, and being sort of able to deliver faster, more, better, uh, I think one of the things that, one of the key themes that we get out of PaaS is people talk about DevOps, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term, but it's basically the ability to uh, combine large uh, development operations, security, networking, uh, business, all these components together for single projects to kind of get things done faster, more consistently. And one of the great enablers of that is the ability to do PaaS, uh, to be able to tell a group of developers you don't have to wait for IT to, to procure, install, patch and deliver a bunch of servers that are probably uh, you know not exactly to your spec anyway uh, for three months while you uh, you could do it yourself with a credit card or if it's internal and well built you could do it yourself within an afternoon or a couple hours right so the ability to what we uh, as Gene Kim puts it to fail fail hard uh, fail hard fail fast and fail cheap so if you're going to go prototyping new products the way to get to market faster and beat your competitor is to be able to spool up something brand new a service without having to go put all the back end behind it. So you do it in the public cloud, perfect place for it. You get the PaaS infrastructure, all, everything's already built. If you can, from a security perspective, build it secure by design, so security team, security organization with an architecture viewpoint, designs a bunch of virtual machines or virtual environments once, so that it's secured or relatively risk averse from the get go, then a developer can go and spool up as many VMs as they want. They're just going to come up without all the security problems that we have to then spend and go back and patch and, and monitor and check. So agility, it's, I'm, for me, it's a lot, a lot about agility and being able to deliver better and pass just does it. And even to add to the agility, and I, again, this is odd that I'm agreeing with both of them nonetheless, but. Somebody get a picture of this. I know, I know. It's on film. So huh. from. Um, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint and from an executive standpoint, the ability to basically have disposable services is a, is a financial asset to us and, you know, trying to ensure that we're not impeding the development community within our own organization, even on the private pass standpoint. I would agree with uh, my three colleagues with a caveat that if you do spin up uh, uh, you know, these resources in the cloud, uh, really anywhere, try please, for love of God, do it with dummy data because you do not want to be in a conversation with your legal counsel or your auditor about taking live customer data, PII, healthcare, whatever, uh, and say, oh, well, we put it in Amazon because we had to test it and we didn't get the service from IT. Try to find people in your security office that will help you uh, get those uh, dummy data generators or the anonymizers and, uh, and avoid that painful conversation. I just want to step really quick on that. And I think it's very important from the development standpoint, the development community within any organization to make friends with the security office and hopefully your security office is going to have some open-mindedness to pass environments. Because like you were saying, I, I'm actually I'm not sure which one you exactly said it, how quickly it is to take that data and throw it up in the public, you know, in a public space with your own credit card. And it happens, and if you're a security practitioner paying any attention, it's happening every single day in almost every single company. I don't care how good your DLP is. So one other thing to think, uh, to kind of uh, 
left out when I was mentioning all the fun agility stuff is one of the really cool benefits if you've got a consistent environment where most environments that we've talked to, that we've, I work with, um, don't just have a public presence or a private cloud presence, it's kind of all of the above. And uh, it's really nice for the ones that have a consistent environment. So, uh, as, oh, you know, full disclosure, we stand, standardize on OpenStack, for example. There's all sorts of other environments to standardize, but if you've got like a consistent environment, you can build model once and deploy many, many times. Again, it cuts down on how fast you can deliver, how, many, how much engagement your security organization has to bring in, which the less you have to get engagement, the less meetings you have to have, the happier everybody is, and the less there's an opportunity for somebody to screw something up. All right, so if I'm a business and I'm moving to the cloud and I'm adopting PaaS, what would you guys say, or how, what, how would you recommend that my security architecture needs to change in order to handle that? Are there any specifics? Are there, are there any um, things that you, you would recommend? I just think it needs a change because uh, there's still entirely too many uh, organizations that believe you can take the same poorly performing application that sits in your data center under utilizing resources and, and kind of dogging it and jam it into a cloud environment and magically it's somehow going to be more secure and better. In fact, the exact opposite is going to be true. Mm -hmm. The security model doesn't f generally, what we have today is we've got, you know, for, like the, the really bad fortress, the M&M model of security, right? We've got the hard outer shell, soft chewy middle. Uh, and once you get the applications and data don't defend themselves very well. So we depend on our network and our perimeter. Well, you put an application in, your, in a, a PaaS or in a cloud, um, things get kind of hairy and your app, the, the perimeter dissolves. There is no perimeter around yourself anymore. So having, just having under, the understanding that you're putting your application, it has to be re-architected in many cases. It has to be able to be built for that uh, scalability, that elasticity, that agility. It's, you can't just forklift it. I know there's a lot of vendors out there, and so I think one important thing that customers need to understand about putting their data in a public or even use, utilizing your product to use a private pass is understanding what happens with their data and ensuring, again, I, I'm a big proponent for breaking down barriers with you know, traditional security organizations and making sure people have open minds to understand the new technology is there to assist, not to impede, but to proceed with caution and create some type of audit architecture from a security standpoint to understand what developers are doing, how they're doing it, and how they're disposing of it. Yeah. Nice, ring, nice ringtone. Yeah. A, a lot of the vendors you're used to dealing with in the traditional data center uh, server side will outright lie their ass off to your face <laughs> and tell you that they have a cloud X. Oh, we have firewalls, or we have this or that, and they add the word cloud to it and they think their job is done. And uh, as a consultant, I work with security officers to avoid that kind of vaporware and ridiculosity. And I see it every day. <laughs> That's a technical term. It. And it's, a consulting uh, term. it's really sad because there is a lot of marketing just silliness out there that they literally add the word cloud or they put pass or fast, IS, whatever the bar marketing term du jour is and they just uh, take their old legacy IT stuff and want to market it to you, and it's working. Um, so the things that work in a traditional data center environment do not necessarily hop the fence to cloud uh, overnight because you add the word in marketing literature. You have to test these things out, you have to look at uh, how they uh, work in a particular cloud environment that you're looking for, and do they work with your infrastructure. What a lot of times what they do is they take a you know sixty thousand, hundred thousand, quarter million dollar appliance, they strip the hardware out and they put the entire software firmware stack on a virtual machine and say cloud, uh, and they think again their job is done and obviously it's not because that's not how cloud works. So uh, it's not it wasn't designed to be hierarchically administered. It wasn't designed to be decentrally administered. It was designed to protect that rack over there in this data center. And the whole point of cloud is you don't have a rack to point to. Uh, so be suspicious and cautious when uh, buying stuff. Uh, yeah, all, right. all this stuff, this is mostly infrastructure. Is there anything at the platform level, really, that can be refactored out of the application and so that the developers don't have that as a concern and then refactored into the orthogonal service that can be leveraged by the application? Not sure I label it as 
infrastructure, uh, maybe. To my point of view, I mean, a lot of that stuff is infrastructure. I mean, for any kind of um, part of the application, like in J2E, you can restrict certain method calls so that they're rule based scripts. Is there anything in any platform that can be leveraged in that way? Just kind of a wrapper or a constraint? That'd probably be service dependent, vendor dependent. I, I mean, I guess what a bit of what you're saying, what, what Gal here was saying, is. is Speaks to the confidence of of the the vendor partner, the vendor consumer relationship with cloud. It's not any different than what we had previously with all our other vendors. I think now it's, it's it has to be a much tighter, more auditable uh, relationship. I think we can safely, in the, particularly in a past cloud, we can more readily engage people that are working in the uh, development realm that actually understand the application stack, that actually understand the code stack. Uh, the, to, like you said, to bring that into the environment rather than just simply uh, decouple hardware. And I'll, I'll give you a specific example, a web application firewall that is designed 10 years ago in a big iron fashion to protect that rack. Uh, how do you translate that to AWS? You can't without really understanding how this stuff works. So um, whether that's infrastructure or other, because you kind of have to embed it into each VM as it's spinning up and down depending on uh, where you are, scale, uh, demand. That, that's a different conversation. David, did you want to add something? So uh, I haven't had a chance to do a deep dive into all the POS products out there, but as a general rule um, in the cloud in general, whether it's as infrastructure as a service to SaaS or anything in between, uh, the degree of access control mechanisms that you're used to in the enterprise are generally not available in the cloud products. Um, so you do need to look to uh, third-party products to address that. Uh, similarly, uh, the level of logging that you get, especially at the API level, is generally non-existent in the public cloud. So if you have compliance concerns, like especially around PCI and HIPAA, where you need to be able to say exp specifically who did each and every action that might relate to anything security related, um, that also generally is not provided by any of the cloud providers at any, at any level. And so you can't actually, you know, technically you can't pass a PCI audit in with most cloud providers unless you are using a third party tool or have a whole lot of process that's manual internally. All right, well, why don't we move this conversation a little bit more to application security issues. So um, unlike the case of an application that can potentially run in an isolated environment using only local resources, pass applications, access networks intrinsically, what kind of specific security exposures does a pass application developer have to manage? Anyone? <laughs> David? Roth? I've There's some debate over who's going to yeah. handle it. I guess they're throwing around the hot potato up here. What's going on? We're, we're, we're too busy deferring to each other. Oh, too. okay. <laughs> we're so polite. I mean, it's, again, I mean, one of the things, it's not so much application specific, but when you're looking at PaaS providers, you do want to understand what they're using for their, you know, the virtualization technologies to separate those container services from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, your typical... Um, a lot of like J2E, well, J2E is a bad example because they've done a pretty good job, but for some other languages, the virtualization containers haven't been, haven't been designed with multi-tenancy in mind or multiple applications in mind as much as the Java one has. So you definitely want to at least make sure that your provider uh, is doing, has taken some good precautions and is doing the basics right, um, just so you know, especially when you're dealing with multi-tenancy that like, memory is properly locked out and things like that. So from the past perspective, as far as applications go, it, it, we're starting to have to figure out the package. When we start packaging applications at the code level, uh, what we're doing is we're, we're now pushing them to an environment that we haven't built ourselves largely, right? So the the, machine, the virtual machine that's running on the uh, application server that's running on, we haven't developed either developers or ops folks that work inside our organization is used to building that, and now it's outside of our control. Now we have to sort of inherently trust or have some auditability behind that environment that we're pushing to. So now we, we can deploy configuration files and we can deploy uh, all sorts of uh, uh, hooks into that, right? But it's not, the environment itself isn't built by us. So I think that's probably the main differentiator between, uh, on the application side, um, besides obviously the code, but. Um, yeah. Also, uh, you know, to be honest, if you're worrying about the security of your pause platform beyond the basics, um, you're probably looking the wrong direction in terms of security. I mean, you, there's been a lot of breaches over the last few years, SaaS providers, on-premise providers, and everything between. And inevitably, 
it is either an access, access control issue of basic credentials or it's a SQL injection vulnerability. So those are the things your developers should be worrying about and your operations folks should be worrying about, not so much the specific security issues around your cloud provider other than compliance related needs. Yeah. So, yeah, so extending on that line, are you seeing that this is called either cloud or more specifically has providers, and I'm assuming I guess it's a public has provider, that are actually working with enterprise security teams in a more transparent or collaborative fashion? Because some of the things mm -hmm. you're talking about assessing, you know, an audit may be you know, a mechanism, but some of the things you're talking about assessing it comes down to what are our processes and procedures when there is an issue, when there has been a breach, or local collaboration coordination. Yeah, I, I do, yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen with, with many people across the entire cloud spectrum, in fact, across the entire outsourcing spectrum of one of those things you need to do is just understand, you know, what are the process, what are the agreed upon processes and procedures um, for every, I mean, not just for a breach, but also what, you know, what about legal notice, you know, um, at least in the U.S., um, if, if the federal government or a local law enforcement agency goes to a cloud provider and says, give me David Mortman's information, they have no requirement to notify me whatsoever, regardless of what legal, uh, under what act or what legal jurisdiction they're under, there's no requirement for them to notify me unless I negotiate some sort of notification terms uh, as part of the contract. You just said something that is very important, you use the word outsourcing. Public has is effectively outsourcing. In fact, public infrastructure service is effectively outsourcing. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, but I think going back to some of the original statements about that, it all is going to go down to your data classification, what you're putting out there. I mean, and that, that relieves a lot of anguish internally and externally from an outsource standpoint. Yeah, but if, if you look at like the Verizon uh, breach report that they publish, the Verizon publishes each year on the basis of, of their investigations, there has not been a single incident that has been related to violations of, you know, uh, of, a, of a pause platform or a SaaS platform as a basis of their virtualization containers. It's always SQL injection, it's always breached uh, credentials, it's always application logic flaws. I think that speaks to the fact that there are just way too many easier problems to exploit. The vir we're just now touching on the fact that vir I mean, virtualization is, is going to be attacked, and to some extent, I think you've got an example of that, mm -hmm. um, of the uh, Zen. Uh, yeah, guest to host escape just got dropped yesterday. Escape. It's on CERT. If you search guest to host escape, I mean, US CERT, right, CERT. But if, that, if that's your biggest concern, I, I would surmise that you have a very, very risk averse um, software security uh, platform and program, and that is, I, I just don't see that level of robustness out there. Or you're being targeted by smart people. I, I think I saw a question in the back, and then we'll go up here. Actually, can you speak up a little bit? It's hard to hear you. Yeah, so uh, around SQL injection, Cloudflare is a lightweight, you know, um, as a service that claims to be able to help with that. What do you think about using uh, Cloudflare as a cloud-based service like Cloudflare? So, uh, so the question, just so we can get, is that there are services, uh, Cloudflare is the, the, the big player right now. There, there's some others as well mm -hmm. that essentially act as web application firewalls. And what was our, our opinion about them? I, I, Cloudflare, uh, I've used it myself um, with some other organizations. It's a pretty good product. They actually they themselves recently had a, a, an issue where they were down for a while, which caused issues. Um, I think it's a great, I, personally I think it's a great tool. Um, you can deploy your own web application firewall using mod security. Um, there's a few other products that are, uh, that are coming down the pike for, um, for public cloud stuff as well. And there's a bunch that are already available for private cloud. I think the one thing we have to make sure is to, that we're comfortable with is that platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service, cloud networks are essentially flat. Right, you have to you have to make your peace with that. The fact that you, you know, even with multi-tenancy and all that, and, and cryptographic enforcement of data storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the networks are still flat. You can still so, but I'm just you know because we're going from this the M and M model to a flat network. Right. We always had too much agreement, so I had to disagree. Oh. I, I don't I don't care that they're flat. Darn you, David, you're wrong. <laughs> there, I fixed it. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, I, I got a question. Yeah. So let me, let me make sure I understood the question. So the question was, um, 
as a, as a company, what did we do to look at Cloud Foundry security before deciding to support it? Uh, I, I honestly couldn't tell you. We supported Cloud Foundry before I got there. Um, so I, I honestly couldn't tell you what, what the specific requirements were that we went through in, the, in that particular case. Um, in general, we support the clouds that our customers want us to support, and we help them out as best we can. Okay. All right. Um, just moving back to some of our questions, I do want to address privacy since this um, panel is about security and privacy, so I'll throw in a question about that. Aaron, I think maybe you might be the one that, that could speak best to this. Are there any specific privacy issues related to PASS? Does PASS provide um, any uh, benefits uh, against when you're, when you're going through compliance issues in relation to privacy? I mean, right now, in regards to privacy, I, I think the largest obstacles, like I keep preaching over and over, is depending on what type of data you're using, what you're utilizing it for, and what type of data you're putting out there. I mean, if it's components of using it from PASS as a, as a dev platform, it depends on what type of code. Is it proprietary code, or are you just wrapping things together? I mean, where, where are you actually applying it and ensuring that your security compliance office understands that? I mean, to get into the whole, you know, credit card data, PCI components of utilizing the cloud or pass, I mean, at this point, to go to the flat network, I mean, you have a few other obstacles to overcome. The PCI is just starting to get its arms around virtualization in general, so. Yeah, and uh, PC, for both PCI and HIPAA, the entire stack needs to be certified PCI compliant, so everything from the hardware all the way up to the application layer. So to even begin to considering deploying one of these applications in a compliant manner, your, uh, the cloud provider, every, starting with the infrastructure layer, needs to be certified PCI compliant. However, that's not sufficient. You can't just say, well, Amazon is certified PCI compliant. Ta-da, I can throw my credit card data yeah. up there safely. <laughs> you can't do that. I mean, you still, need to, you still need to make sure that your entire application stack is secure, and, can, and you can convince a QSA you're doing the right things. Uh, however, you can't do that on a cloud provider who hasn't gone to the trouble that Amazon has to become PCI compliant, because it doesn't matter how good your application stack is if it's running on a non-compliant uh, uh, hardware stack. Very true. Okay. What about, um, I mean, I hear about data scrubbing and whatnot. Is that, is that just something that, and, and you know, deleting data and making sure it's gone when you, when you leave? you leave from, a, a, I guess, a of the servers or the cloud environment. I mean, is there anything past specific or is that just pretty much a cloud issue? It's I mean, I'm sorry, not a cloud, I, I, just cloud general in general. Practice. Yeah. It's, it's a general practice. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, uh, you know, the best thing to do in that situation is just never to write data to disk in the clear, keep it stored encrypted. Um, and that way, um, destruct, all you have to worry about is destroying the keys, and destroying a small amount of data securely is a lot easier than destroying a large amount of data securely. And you can get past your typical audit by just demonstrating that you've destroyed the keys and then the encrypted data is unrecoverable. And even to kind of go into the you know, internal or private pass environment, one of the advantages it does have is the ability to wipe clean, or you can do a nightly wipe if, if necessary. And so even if you're not using scrub data, but you have a secure internal pass environment, you can show from a compliance and privacy standpoint that you're going through the right risk mitigation steps to ensure that you're remaining within compliance. And especially on the internal pass standpoint or internal cloud, you can take a lot more mitigating steps in regards to audit and process and procedures. And if, and a particularly uh, geeky example is that uh, if you're running on a, on a cloud that's using a Zen for its, as its virtualization layer uh, you're, and you're doing crypto, uh, dev random is actually incredibly not random uh, and your level of entropy goes away almost immediately uh, and that's actually on the basis of the hardware, not the actual virtualization instance you're working on. So if you're on a highly virtualized piece of hardware, like you say, like a small instance on Amazon where there's like dozens of VMs, essentially you're never getting any randomness, so you should always be sure to use dev u random if it's on a Linux box and it's on a Zen platform. Okay. All right, well I want to make sure we have some time for any additional audience questions, um, but I do want to ask you guys one last thing, um, that we've all seen current events, the LinkedIn breach. Um, I know that this might not be PaaS specific, but you guys are all security professionals, and I know that there's been um, some notice that LinkedIn did not ha does not have a CSO or a CISO. And um, you know, there's been some discussion around that, and, and are those C-level executives necessary in 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 business? And, I, and I'm very curious as to see what what you how you guys feel about it. And then on top of it, what kind of development and training would be useful um, to address past deficiencies with like DevOps or AppSec or or what do you guys think? 
although this might be a career limiting statement, I don't think that a CSO is necessarily important in every application or every environment or cloud environment or technology firm, but a person who is centrally responsible for security is. Somebody who has the oversight over the entire security of every or of the organizational components is very important. Um, I, um, I also have gone and done, I'm a QSA and I've also gone and done assessments and from a QSA standpoint, it's very frustrating from an assessor when you see organizations that each component has certain security roles, but none of them are unified and they're generally missing huge, huge gaps just because no one person has that oversight because they think, you know, Dev Team A is doing it, Dev Team P is doing it, but no one's actually doing certain functions. Uh, right on. It's not really about a job title. It's about who's got the responsibility, the capability. And authority. And authority. And authority, exactly. Authority. And it's, it's the ability to be able to do some kind of, have a pragmatic security program that actually makes sense to the business rather than simply having a, a C-level title. One thing that I'll mention about the whole chief information security officer role is, um, this was a debate on Twitter yesterday, and we talked about how very few CISOs are actually chief executives. They're not actually executives at all. In fact, they're not even, most of them are not junior executives. They're just security managers. Fall guy figurehead. They're, that, what he said, I, right? I, and I'm so, not politically restricted and by so you're, you're the, the corporation. <laughs> so you, you become, a lot of the CISOs just are basically doomed to fail because they're brought in to secure the organization. They're given all their, the, the, a lot of the responsibility, but absolutely no authority. And so there is absolutely no possible way out of that hole. Or they're reporting up to a CIO or CTO. Or CTO, so. and then just it's time for a new job. Yeah. Right. There, there's a conflict there, right? Yeah. A Uptime, security, you know. They'll always butt heads. Yeah. Right. And even if they're reporting into a CFO office, it doesn't necessarily make, sh make it function right. You have to do what's going to work for your organization, what makes sense for the stakeholders in your organization. Optimally, it would be to report to the board or some oversight over the entire organization. The, the other issue is uh, it, it, because security now has uh, you know, supposedly the in the, the big uh, room in Mahogany Row, uh, access to that, and you know we're on Forbes, and we're on New York Times, we're on Washington Post. Just in the last three years, there's been a huge exposure to kind of the sea level and board uh, and public uh, understanding of what this internet security thing means. Uh, everything from military to personal life to economics, uh, international relations, it's everywhere, and it's affecting everything. So people are starting to understand the strategic implications of information security. Uh, what I think to bring it back to PaaS or SaaS or infrastructure or whatever it, and cloud is when you hear breaches from LinkedIn or whatever other companies, just because you can reach them with a browser doesn't mean that they're a cloud company. It doesn't mean that they got breached with a cloud specific vulnerability, right? So a lot of, like uh, David said, a lot of these uh, big breaches are really low hanging fruit. Uh, SQL injection is still with us. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And it's really uh, just one of those things. It's an artifact from many, many years of uh, epic fail uh, from our point of view as well. I, I think and it's important that the, whoever, if you guys are, if you're contemplating uh, cloud first off, if you're in, going down that strategy, whether it's infrastructure as a service, uh, platform or software as a service, you got to just make sure that you, the people you're working with from the information security perspective actually understand the platform, actually understand what it is you're doing, and actually understand the point of view that you're taking. Uh, it's, it, it is a fundamentally different way of computing, delivering, it's a service, not a product anymore. It's not a box, it's a, it's a service. And so that, that has to be able to be made clear. And if they don't get, if your CISO doesn't get that, so I, I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm a former CISO. Uh, I like to think I'm, I'm going to let you have you're the last word then. You're, reco <laughs> you're a recovering CISO. Uh, I'm a recovering CISO. One never actually. Oh, sorry. No, no one actually ever completely recovers, and um, I have to say that uh, there was a lot of press around the fact that Sony and LinkedIn both didn't have CISOs during their breaches. Um, but you'll note that there have been literally hundreds of organizations over the last five years that have had breaches. The vast majority of whom had CISOs. And so, I mean, the bigger question you have to ask is, well, if they had CISOs and couldn't stop it, would that actually have helped LinkedIn or Sony? Great. All right. Well, um, I'd like to open this up to audience questions. We had some during the panel. I, I can tell we have two, two, two minutes or two questions. Okay, we have two minutes. So um, who? Ask them did, quick. I'll have you go first. Th 
broadly? I have a great product for you. <laughs> It, the question was, has anybody looked at the, uh, I guess it's a, essentially it's throttling um, uh, spawning of uh, instances, right? Zombie so, yeah, so how do you How are you securing, how, you know, how are organizations securing the provisioning process within the PaaS environment? Especially at the public cloud, where it's on some credit card or I mean, generally the, generally the public pause providers aren't building that in. Um, that's sort of, that falls under the access control stuff I was talking about before. Um, there are a variety of third party, both open source and commercial products you can put in place to do some throttling and as well as you know, logging and monitoring and alerting um, to identify those sorts of things. Okay. And I think we had one more, one last question. The Cloud Security Alliance. Cloud Security Alliance. The Cloud Security Alliance has quite a bit. It, it mostly focuses on infrastructure as a service, but there are p bits and pieces there around a platform and software as a service. And I actually helped write some of those. So if you have questions, I'm happy to. Yeah. Answer also, them. Uh, NIST, FedRAMP. Uh, the Feds are amazingly, very rapidly uh, starting to move into cloud. If you told me that two years ago, I would have laughed at your face. Yeah, but but uh, they're doing it because they have to. They're saving money. Department but, of Interior just moved 90,000 seats to Google Apps, et cetera. But, yeah, so but NIST has it some, is happening. Yeah, but NIST has some guidelines they published, and they have more coming as NCIS yeah. is yeah. working on stuff as well. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. And you can get a hold of them. All their Twitter handles are up here. And uh, it says that I'm a lawyer, so I'm a lawyer and a real person. So we can talk about that afterward. But uh, give them all a round of applause, and thank you so much for coming. So I, I, th I, I kind of nodded off there at the end. So I think what I heard was that we should all throttle our pass vendors. Is that what I heard? Okay, cool. Excellent. <laughs>